Welcome to GradCast, the official podcast of the Society of Graduate Students at the University of Western Ontario. Welcome to GradCast, another, uh, the official podcast of the Society of Graduate Students at the University of Western Ontario. I'm Tristan Johnson, and I'm here with Greg French. Hello, everyone. Greg French is a PhD student, a fourth-year PhD student here. Uh, kind of going on with our semester of history that we've had going on, and uh, he answered the call, and here he is. So um, I guess I'll just start with introduce yourself and what kind of cool stuff you get up to around here. Okay. Um, so, as Tristan said, my name is Greg French. I'm a fourth-year PhD student uh, here at Western. I'm also a sessional lecturer right now. I'm teaching History 2501E, which is the history of Latin America. And uh, I'm also an academic writing tutor at the right place at uh, King's University College, which is an affiliate college here at Western. Busy times. Yes, I, I wear several hats on a daily basis, but uh, the teaching is nice, and uh, working at King's I re I've really enjoyed. Uh, but it's back to the dissertation now that the uh, the semester has, has nearly come to an end. Yeah, and in history, that's uh, it's quite a long one. It's about like a book, uh, basically. Yes, uh, chapter upon chapter upon chapter. That's right. I'm looking at approximately six body chapters, and for the dissertation, which uh, two have been completed, and three, the third one is being written right now. Um, and then uh, I would add an introduction to the, and a conclusion to that after the the body chapters have been worked out. Yeah. So before the show, we were speaking a little bit, and you were getting revved up as to like the big uh, picture of what you're doing, and it'd be really interesting to know like. Um, you started off in a different but similar topic uh, for your master. You did something on uh, Brazil, and now you're moving, and now you're working on some stuff on the Spanish American War. So can you tell us like that narrative? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so I did my undergraduate work here at Western from 2005 to 2009, and uh, coming out of the, the recession that was uh, that hit uh, North America, the world, in 2008, uh, I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to do after I finished my undergraduate work. Uh, I knew that I really enjoyed history, but uh, wasn't uh, you know the job market. What's next? I think it's something that a lot of undergrad uh, graduate students grapple with. So I thought to myself, you know, this is an excellent opportunity here at Western to do my masters, to work with uh, Luis Maria Hernandez Sanz. Um, who I had uh, as an undergraduate instructor uh, here when I was at Western earlier, and I said, you know, they're going to, you know, the, the history department is going to offer me funding, which is great. I'm going to have an opportunity to teach uh, as a teaching assistant, and I'm also going to have the opportunity to focus on one specific uh, part of history that I was interested in, and that was the uh, that was Brazilian history and also uh, Portuguese history. My uh, my family is, is Portuguese Canadian, um, and I've always been interested in Portuguese history. So uh, I made it into an academic topic, essentially, and I looked at the Portuguese economy, or the, excuse me, the Brazilian economy within the, the Portuguese empire. So to a certain degree, um, this discussion of empire and, and imperial conversation was, was going on even before the PhD, the PhD started, but uh, within a completely other context, of course, touching on Latin America, but nothing to do with the United States now. So what, what caused that... Um abrupt change in your interests? I took a course when, uh, when I was doing my PhD with uh, Professor Frank Schumacher. Uh, the course was the United States and Empire, I believe. Uh, I'm not entirely sure of the exact title, but it was about 1700 to the present. And it was a discussion about the United States as a, as a U.S. imperial history, as an imperial entity, and the effect that the United States Empire had on uh, both foreign relations and also domestic relations as well. And uh, within the course, uh, we were asked to write a research paper, 25, 30 pages, I don't recall exactly what it was. Um, and it was, it could be on anything. Anything that had to do with the United States and empire and had to be approved. And uh, so as I was doing some of the secondary uh, reading for just, just for the course itself, I came across uh, a few... A few words or sentences that addressed uh, the United States attempting to purchase Cuba, um, in, specifically in 1848. It happens a few times, but uh, in 1848, yes, the United States uh, attempts to purchase Cuba for $100 million. Um, and this, this interesting part of history kind of sparked something, I think, within me. Um, and that was that why within the context of uh, the United States, both in the 19th century and the 20th century, where they were comfortable with uh, invading certain countries uh, in Central America just for a period of time, say, why did they have a, a certain level of respect 
um, at least at that point I was referring to it as respect for the Spanish and why would they not simply have the military invade now there's there's several layers to this of course but at the very root of it I was thinking to myself do the does the United States uh, both middle class upper class individuals the political administrations of the time do they view Spain differently than this black legend narrative that was being presented to me, this anti-Catholic, anti-modern, uh, antithetical of what the United States was, this emerging country and empire in the late 19th century. And as I think most dissertations go, you start catching other lines and other secondary sources. And uh, as I did complete the course and then started working on my comprehensive exams, I noticed these small uh, Alfred McCoy, from, uh, who's written several works with the uh, University of Wisconsin Press, refer, would refer to as capillaries of empire. These connections that um, Americans would have with the outside world. And, and as I was going through my readings, as I was saying for my comps, I noticed that the, these men and women uh, had positive images, uh, positive images towards the United States, or excuse me, towards Spain, which was interesting because, you know, you have the context of the Spanish-American War in 1898. How can uh, one group of people in a country like someone else, you know, at the very simplest base, like someone that they're willing to go to war with? And, you know, it, it speaks to this academic history where there's not always one narrative, right? There's several narratives. And that led really to this, the development of different chapters uh, within my work and um, noticing where these capillaries of empire occur, these contacts between middle and upper class American men and women. And uh, eventually, you know, the climax of the work and chronologically speaking, the climax of this relationship is the 1898 Spanish-American War, uh, where once the United States arrives in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, there's a great deal of inter-imperial uh, relations going on between the United States and um, some of the Spanish that remained in the islands, which is interesting because for the most part that's been a that that's something that hasn't been addressed within within the field of study. So, hmm. I guess you know there goes the dissertation, right? Perfect. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so, where has that taken you? Like, um, people end up all over the place doing this kind of research. So, you could get down this rabbit hole of looking at the things. Where what kind of um, interesting tidbits have you gotten your hands on? Yeah, so I think the, I think it should begin, and it did begin with, with the secondary research, uh, picking up uh, little bits and pieces, as you said, here and there. So uh, an excellent example would have been uh, Kristen Hoganson's work. Uh, she's from the University of Illinois. Um, her work, uh, Consumers Imperium, where she's uh, dealing with um, women, particularly U.S. women, this middle, middle upper class uh, women in the United States in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, and the way they're decorating their homes, the way they're engaging with uh, immigrants. Um, and I noticed that uh, there were literary clubs, women's literary clubs, particularly in the American Northeast and the American Midwest, that uh, they, these literary clubs were taking these imaginary journeys to Spain. Um, they would sit in their front parlors and they would read uh, about what it would be like to travel through Spain. They would dress up in Spanish uh, clothing. They would have Spanish-themed parties. Um, you know, this worked into the narrative really well. And um, I did most of my research for that specific chapter uh, from the Bayview Magazine, which is located... Uh, Look at the University of Michigan. They have all of them. So yeah, uh, that was one location that I traveled to. I traveled to the University of Michigan on a on a fellowship from the Bentley Historical Library. Um, that was that was in uh, that was last year. So that would have been in uh, 2013. That was two years ago. So it would have been 2013. I'm starting to date myself now. <laughs> uh, I've also been to the University of Wisconsin to do some research on Singer sewing machines uh, and McCormick, excuse me, harvesters. Um, and that was from a, a travel grant from the University of Western Ontario. Um, I've been to, I was at the University of Michigan twice. I was at, uh, I was in Carlisle, Pennsylvania at the U.S. Army War College on a travel grant that they offered me, which was fantastic. And last summer, um, I was at the Library of Congress, the National Archive, and uh, several libraries of the, and archives of the Smithsonian on a uh, on a fellowship from the German Historical Institute, and that's where I'll, you know, probably 60 to 70 percent of my research uh, was acquired. So I hope, knock on wood, that I have the majority of my my research now, and now I'm very much in the, the writing process. 
So I do have to ask then, what did you, uh, what, what was, what's the key behind this? What was the image of Spain in America or... If well, there's a if there's a definitive non 300 page answer to it, <laughs> yeah, um, I'll summarize it in two seconds for you. No, um, there's several images to answer to answer your question. Um, the popular image, and what I mean by that is both uh, what you would see in like a, a yellow press type magazine, or a uh, as you would see in the in the historiography, uh, for the most part, is this black legend narrative. This anti-Catholic, anti-modern uh, image of, uh, of the Spanish. However, um, I'm noticing, that, or I was noticing and I continue to notice that there was a, was a positive image of the Spanish. Um, and it manifests itself in a variety of different ways. It can be women traveling, um, having these imaginary journeys, or it can be this, uh, this image that uh, appears at World's Fairs, international expositions during the period where the United States is attempting to justify itself as a global power. And even before the War of 1898, there's an uh, international exposition in 1892 in, in Madrid, and then the larger one, the World's Columbian Expo Exposition in, uh, in Chicago in 1893. And the United States is attempting to justify its imperial desires through uh, the image of Christopher Columbus. Um, borrowing from this narrative of Christopher Columbus, who wasn't Spanish to begin with, uh, <laughs> but uh, they've created him as almost this Spanish type American figure, and it's almost as if the, it's a process. It was, uh, and this goes, this works into the narrative of social Darwinism to, to a certain degree, and the level of civilization that was, or the beliefs in civilization that were popular during the period. And it's an evolution of, you know, first came the Spanish. We're going to borrow, borrow from the Spanish. This is this inter-imperial relationship that I'm discussing. We're going to borrow from the Spanish and create our own empire, but it's not exceptional. And I can't stress that enough. It's a, I create an anti-exceptional narrative with my, within my dissertation. This is, it is, it is borrowing from other empires. Um, historians, uh, particularly I'm thinking uh, Julian Goh, and Paul Kramer have focused on the interimperial relationship between the United States and Britain, which would make sense, right? Um, you know, the most powerful empire in the 19th century, the British, and then the United States borrowing from them. Well, I look at it you know, slightly differently in the sense that the, these several Americans had uh, an interest in the Spanish uh, Empire and what they could learn from the Spanish, uh, both positive and negative outcomes of the Spanish Empire, certainly. Uh, but in the, in the laws that are created in... Um, America's overseas possessions, uh, the treatment of indigenous people in the American West, this is all borrowing from the Spanish. Um, and that's really what my dissertation discusses. That's really interesting because um, one thing that really, um, if you take like the really typical American history, they Something from really, the History Channel. Yeah, yeah. they really <laughs> underrepresent how much they've had to engage with with uh, Spanish as like uh, either the country, the language, even today, uh, there's the whole backlash against the increase in the Spanish language in the southern United States, and you know, without thinking that that whole region used to be Mexico, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, uh, of course, it's a uh, it's so obviously something uh, either ended or changed, uh, and you said it comes to a head with the Spanish American War. So then, what happens after the Spanish American War? That kind of gets Spanish outside of their this cultural consciousness. Yeah. Um, I think it really very much climaxes with the Spanish-American War and um, the interaction or the inter-imperial uh, relationship that develops between the two countries or the individuals from the two countries in America's overseas possessions. Um, there is, and this is, this is something I've kind of stayed away from to a certain degree because Richard Kagan from John Hopkins University has addressed this issue in more depth. Uh, but there, is, there appears to be, as he would say, a Spanish craze that emerges out of the War of 1898, a desire to um, actually engage and increase um, Americans' knowledge of the Spanish. Um, museums are open, particularly in New York City, having Spanish artifacts in them. Spanish architecture becomes very popular in the United States, Spanish art as well. Um, why does this occur? Um, perhaps it's this idea that, um, you know, maybe it's an inter a colonizer, and I've never really thought about this, but uh, so I'm just going off the top of my head, but it's almost a 
another type of colonization or an advancement of civilization. We've, we've taken over these lands that were formerly European, formerly Spanish, and now we will take these goods and show to our people what we've done to a certain degree. And that's, that might be an interesting thing to include in the, very much in the conclusion, uh, touching on the denouement, if you will, of the period, this of the long 19th century. Um, it's always difficult to bookend things, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we, it's very difficult. I, my, my work ends approximately around 1914, uh, but there's no particular reason why other than the outbreak of the First World War in, in, in Europe. But uh, there was always an interest in the Spanish, I think. This, this, this narrative isolation in the United States, it doesn't exist, in my opinion. Um, even during the American Revolution, and I touch on this in my first body chapter, um, Washington had uh, Spanish officials uh, with him, working with him. Um, and some of these individuals intermarried. Uh, with some associates of uh, high-ranking officials uh, that Washington was in, in connection with. Uh, we see in 1807 or 1808 there is a uh, celebration uh, in Boston to uh, commemorate uh, the Spanish involvement in their conflict with Napoleon. Um, so there, I think this interest always existed. It even predates the American Revolution where there's an interest in the, the Hispanic language particularly in the American Northeast, uh, with the establishment of, of uh, Hispanic, uh, Hispanic or Hispanic Studies programs at uh, Ivy League institutions, particularly Harvard. So there's always been this interest um, in Spain, in, in Europe, uh, but it's particularly been focused on, or it's been, the individuals that have been attracted to it very much have been this upper middle class individual in the United States uh, during, during the 19th century, but it really climaxes in the, in the late 19th century. Yeah, because I guess then uh, my question would be like, yeah, whence cometh the uh, this is America, speak American mentality towards really not just Spain, but I mean, I don't even know if Americans, a lot of Americans take a point, the difference between Spain and Mexico for this point. But, uh, yeah, and that's something that I had to deal with with my research as well. The, the differentiating between Spain proper and, uh, and the Spanish Empire. Um, and for to avoid having the dissertation be 500 pages rather than 300 pages, as yeah. you mentioned, um, I do particularly focus on Spain within the European context and then the Spanish Empire uh, that the United States engaged with in 1898. Um, but, oh, there's plenty of work that's been done, and there is, there's a great deal that can uh, still be done on contact between Americans and Mexicans or contact between Americans and Central Americans uh, and, and, and South Americans, uh, regardless of the decade but, uh, or, or, the, or the century. But I think for the purpose of focusing on the dissertation and not having it turn into something that I can't manage, which is very important, um, yeah, I had to narrow it down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah your work cut out for you. You zoom out and see it more as like America engaging with the, the Spanish world. Yeah, it's also at the same time, though I, I'm focusing on Spain, it's also America engaging with everyone. Yeah. You know, the emergence of the United States uh, after the Civil War, um, you know, not only the westward movement across the continent, but engagement in, in global affairs, really, you know, Roosevelt being the man standing on the podium, uh, really taking pride in, in, his, in what the United States was. Um, is, is, is certainly part of this narrative as well, as well if I was zooming out. So it's not just Spain that the United States is interacting with or engaging with. Um, and we have to remember as well that uh, it, it's engaging with them in a variety of different ways. It could be Singer sewing machines. It could be U.S. Marines invading um, Nicaragua. You know, it, it varies. Uh, so the United States, uh, far from being an isolationist uh, nation, was heavily engaged in foreign uh, Four relations uh, in the late 19th century and then in, in the early 20th century as well. Yeah, we're kind of we kind of have been dancing around the bull moose in the room. But uh, so did Teddy Roosevelt uh, play a role in this um, the spanophilia, hispanophilia that goes on in this period? It's interesting that you asked that. There was there is some interesting work that's being done on uh, Roosevelt and really trying to figure out his engagement with the Philippines prior to the outbreak of the Spanish-American War. Um, and his interest with uh, acquiring the area and his communications with Dewey uh, in the Pacific. Um, 
also he when he's traveling through he's, you know Roosevelt traveled through Europe as a boy several times and, ha and had contact with uh, the Spanish at, at varying levels um, but that's certainly something that uh, is going to be looked at in the future and should continue to be looked at the, the, the issue being uh, with Roosevelt is it's such a Oh, a broad topic. You know, that could yeah. be that could be a comprehensive exam field in itself. Uh, he is such an interesting figure, and and he died relatively young too. You know, if he lived another ten years, who knows how much more literature would have been uh, written about him? But uh, he is an interesting figure. Also, my supervisor Frank Schumacher is actually working on a on a, on a work on Roosevelt right now, and I did a, I did some research for him a few years ago, which was really interesting. He's such a fascinating figure, Roosevelt. Uh, really, you know, quote unquote, the representation of what the United States was to you know many individuals then and even now. Yeah, I was hoping we could squeeze out another fun Teddy Roosevelt story. Um, oh, <laughs> if you discover any new ones, let us know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a, too many new ones per se, um, but he is, and very he does very much represent what the United States was to a certain degree, or what they would like to be in the period. Uh, you know, that not only from a, a bombastic, uh, larger than life type figure, but even down to you know. Uh, social Darwinism and his beliefs in surrounding, you know, the evolution of civilization. He's part of that narrative, and he made sure he was very much part of that narrative. So, yeah, very interesting figure, certainly. All righty, Greg, thank you so much for coming on Gradcast Day. It's been a great show. Thank you. Oh, thanks for having me. That's all for this week. If you want to send us some feedback, or if you want to come on the show yourself, email us at gradcastradio at gmail.com. Be sure to hook us up on social media. On Twitter, we're at Gradcast Radio, and look up Gradcast Radio also on Facebook. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, the podcast is located at gradcast.podbean.com, and it's on iTunes. And while you're there, why don't you leave us a review? It really helps us out. We'll see you guys next week.